A 12-year-old little girl named Sarah woke up in the middle of the night and she heard sounds of her mother fighting with someone. She sat frozen next to her bedroom door as she heard her mother scream again and again. Then there was some kind of commotion, a knife being pulled out of a drawer, and then silence. When Sarah finally felt safe enough to leave her bedroom, what she found changed the course of her entire life forever. This is her story. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, it's nice to finally meet you. And before I forget, someone in the comments recently reminded me to tell you to please subscribe. I know that so many of you watch, but sometimes forget to hit the button and the bell so you'll get notified when I post. This week, I actually posted an extra video on Monday and I don't want you to miss out. And it would mean so much to me. So please subscribe. I'm usually someone who doesn't care too much about security and privacy online. I kind of just take my chances, but recently I have seen so many YouTubers get their channels hacked. And this is happening more and more, not just to creators, but even my friends and family members have had their Instagram and Facebook accounts taken over and they were never able to get them back. This video is sponsored by Surfshark. So after doing my research, I finally realized everyone should be using a VPN and it stands for Virtual Private Network. It's an online privacy tool that encrypts all the data that you share on the internet. This is especially important if your phone ever connects to public Wi-Fi. I know mine has at the airport, even places like Starbucks or the library. And the airport is the number one place hackers love to steal your information. And all it takes is you using your device while you're connected to that network. Many of us will be traveling during the holidays and beyond. So using Surfshark when you're traveling or browsing on public networks will help you make sure your usernames, your passwords, banking, and debit card information are safe. I picked Surfshark because I did my research and they're highly rated. It's the only VPN that allows you to have one account to use on unlimited devices. And that's perfect for me because I switch between my phone, my computer, and my iPad all day, every day. Think of Surfshark as putting a shield between you and the people that are trying to steal your information. And they're out there, they're on the hunt all the time, just waiting for a vulnerable device to connect to. But also a fun thing you can do with Surfshark is stream shows that aren't available in your region. For example, the other day, I wanted to do some research for a case that I'm working on and a show that I wanted to watch wasn't available in the US. There's an easy fix for that with Surfshark. All I have to do is change my country to the one where the show is available and that's it. There's something else I wanna mention and that is search. You can probably imagine the things that I search for while I'm researching these true crime cases, but it's not only about what I search, it's the amount of searching I do. And I love how Surfshark allows me to browse in complete privacy, which means Google isn't tracking the searches and then sending me weird personalized ads connected to those searches, especially when I'm just being me the person and not the creator. And Surfshark Search provides me with an authentic search experience not tied to any of my previous searches or sites I've already visited. I get organic results solely based on my search terms. Surfshark also lets me select a specific region where I wanna get search results from, and this helps with any international cases or people in cases that I'm interested in learning about. All in all, I really believe anyone who spends time online needs a VPN and Surfshark was nice enough to support this channel and make this video possible. So please click the link in my description box below and use my code Kimberlea to get up to six additional months for free. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee so there's no risk to try it out. So head over there now and give it a shot. Now let's get into the video for today. There are going to be many people in this story, but don't worry. The two most important people you will have to keep track of and remember are Crystal and Sarah. But in order to understand who they are, we have to go back and learn about their family, where they came from. Some people get a little annoyed when there's too many names. I can't help that, but I will do my best to make sure I keep you on track. Today, I'm going to be telling you the story of Crystal K. Farnham Perry. Crystal was born in a small town called Rumford in Oxford, Maine on August 23rd of 1963. Her parents were Howard Farnham and Grace Bartlett. Crystal was part of a large family with a long, complex history. And you know, if you've been here, that's what I love to talk about when I do these cases. But before I dive into her life, I wanna introduce you to the matriarch of the family, Crystal's mother, Grace. She was known by everyone 
as Gracie. She was born April 3rd of 1919. She grew up in Newry, Maine, outside of Bethel, about 30 minutes south of Rumford. And I am doing my very best with these pronunciations. If I make a mistake, kindly let me know in the comments because it's important that I know. Rumford had a population of 7,000, Bethel had a population of 2,500, and Newry had a whopping population of just 300 people. These are all rural communities in the mountainous region southwest of White Mountain National Forest. And wow, these towns are stunning. In the fall, the trees in Maine turn beautiful reds and oranges, and there's tons of rivers and waterfalls and hiking trails. I've never been there, but I feel like I'm missing out. Right now, I'm just vicariously living through my research. By the 1900s, rural southwestern Maine was known for its farming, manufacturing, and logging opportunities, and Rumford had a huge paper mill. Bethel was known for its shoemaking and masonry jobs. Gracie grew up in a community and a time where you had to work hard for what you had, and everyone knew everyone else. It's easy to foster close-knit relationships, and it's also easy for rumors to spread. Gracie had six sisters and five brothers, so they grew up having to take care of each other, and Gracie was the primary person looking out for herself. When she was only 17, a month and a half away from her 18th birthday, she got married to a 23-year-old man, he was a cook, named Raymond M. Bartlett. She and Ray moved in together, and they were very much in love at the time, but they had their fights as well. Sometimes their personalities just clashed. Gracie was very particular about the way she organized her home. Perhaps you might call it a little OCD nowadays, but she really loved to have things in order and enjoyed interior decorating, gardening, and listening to music. She actually sounds like someone that I could be friends with. But Gracie especially loved to go out and dance. She liked to let loose. She was pretty, and when she went out, she would catch men's eyes, which sometimes caused Ray to become jealous. Together, they had one child named Keith before Ray left for the Navy. While he supported his family, Gracie took care of their son and continued to enjoy all of her hobbies, including going out on the town while her husband was far away. And eventually, a rumor spread around town that she was cheating on Ray. And his parents believed this rumor, and they convinced him to get a divorce. So Gracie, sadly, ended up moving back home to New Remain. She lived with her parents for a couple years, and during this time, she had her son, Richard. And her parents actually suggested that she put him up for adoption since Gracie didn't have a way to provide for him. And that's hard, especially in those times and the way people would end up judging women who weren't married. They would judge them pretty harshly if they had a child out of wedlock. Gracie's neighbors stepped up, and they eventually raised Richard, and he later ended up becoming the local milkman. But Gracie soon met another man named Howard Farnham, who was in the army. They got married and moved in together just outside of Rumford. She spent the next years of her life as a stay-at-home mom and had 10 children with Howard. Yes, 10. You don't have to remember these people, but you will hear about a few of them. Her son's names were Wendell, Wayne, Webster, and Walter. They really went all in with the W names. And her daughters were Betty, Carol, Gloria, Glenice, Loretta, who went by Tootsie, Gwendolyn, and Crystal. Remember, I told you, Crystal is important because this is her story and her family. Sadly, when Gracie was pregnant, she actually miscarried Walter. So she lost that child, which was very traumatic for her. In the 1950s, attitudes were slowly beginning to change to understand what a miscarriage was and that it wasn't a woman's fault. But a lot of people either didn't know this or they still held the belief that a woman was responsible. Even the name miscarriage makes it sound like a woman made a mistake. So back then, Howard blamed Gracie for the miscarriage, and he took it out on her violently. Having a miscarriage is already devastating enough, but to be hit by your husband because of it is just really sad. Howard was a nasty person. He was aggressive, he was an alcoholic, and he spent most of his life in and out of jail. He and his friends would go around the town just terrorizing people, committing petty theft and robberies. Not only did he hit his own wife, he went to prison for five years for forcing himself on one of his own daughters. Yet Gracie continued to visit him in prison. It was hard being a single mom. And once he got out, Gracie got pregnant with Crystal, her final child, who this case is about. And she gave birth to Crystal Kay when she was 44 years old, and that's pretty impressive, since today, 44 is considered high risk. Even after 35, it's harder. 
I'm telling you all of this backstory because I want you to understand the environment that Crystal was raised in, a community affected by rampant misogyny and domestic altercations. For Crystal's mom, Gracie, she was used to men controlling every aspect of her life. Fighting was the norm, and she herself would end up picking fights and rebel against her husband, Howard. She continued to go out to bars every Friday night, often meeting up with her ex-husband, Ray. She and Howard finally decided to get a divorce when Crystal was only five years old. And very quickly, she remarried her ex-husband, Ray Bartlett. And I don't know if you remember, but Ray was also a controlling alcoholic, but he wasn't as bad as Howard, so she sort of did trade up. But Ray did not like children. That would be a red flag and a hard no for most women who already have children or want them in the future. And remember, Gracie had 10. One was from Ray back when they were married, that was Keith, and nine were Howard's. Crystal grew up surrounded by her siblings in a tiny farmhouse with not enough beds for everyone, with not enough space and not enough food. And the kids would usually share a bed or go to a friend's house for a sleepover. By the time the kids reached high school, many of them left home to escape the toxic environment they were living in. Crystal's primary caretaker was actually her older sister, Glenise. When Crystal and Gwen, the two youngest, were toddlers, Glenise was 12 years old. She was the one worried about them like a mother would be, even though they were her younger sisters. When the little ones went roaming around the yard, Glenise was there to save them. Gwen almost drowned in the creek once. And when someone got injured while running around in nature unsupervised, Glenise had to learn first aid and take care of cuts and wounds by herself. Gracie was just too overwhelmed. I mean, it was a bad situation for everyone. I'm not sure if Gracie wanted as many kids as she had at that point, especially since she's living with a man who doesn't want kids, or if she honestly just didn't know how to handle everything. Poor Glenise finally became too overwhelmed by how much she had to do for her sisters. She left home at the age of 14 knowing the only way to graduate would be to prioritize herself first. Crystal was left alone with her sister, Gwen. Crystal, she was a sweet and fiercely energetic child, and she learned to survive by escaping. She would spend her days biking around town and swimming with Gwen, and both of them had fiery carrot red hair. People actually assumed they were twins because they were close in age. And it's true, sometimes they fought as sisters do, but they always looked out for one another at school and when they were at home, and they avoided Ray's control as much as possible. He never got physical with the kids, but he did have ridiculous rules, like they couldn't eat in the kitchen, and they were only allowed to take baths, and they had to be quiet at all times. So Crystal got out of the house as much as possible, and she excelled in school. She was naturally charismatic, and she met her best friend Linda when they were only eight years old, and they spent a lot of time together as much as possible. Their birthdays were only six days apart, so they would even celebrate every year together. Linda was one of those fun social friends that would drag you out to all the parties, and by the time Crystal reached high school, they were going out every weekend and having the time of their lives. Crystal loved music and dancing just like her mom. She was one of the baton twirlers in her high school band, and she loved a good house party so she could let loose and just lose herself in the music and new people that she was meeting. Crystal was at one of these house parties when she met her future husband, Tom Perry. She was only 15, and Tom was 18, and he even had a girlfriend at the time. But the moment he locked eyes with Crystal, he knew she was the one. He walked up from across the room and started talking to her. Not only was Crystal drop-dead gorgeous, she was smart, funny, and easy to talk to. Crystal was super impressed by Tom's confidence. He was charming, good-looking, and a hard worker. And they were instantly smitten. Tom ended up breaking up with his girlfriend so he could start going on dates with Crystal. I wanted to note, where I live here in California and some other states, it's actually illegal for an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old to be together, since 18 is the age of consent. But in small-town Maine in the 70s, this was legal, and it happened a lot. But I know that things were a lot different back then. Plus, Crystal was in such a toxic environment. And once she and Tom started dating, it was a perfect chance for her to escape her own house and be able to focus on her schoolwork. Tom had a trailer of his own, and she moved all of her stuff in with him. Well, her mom, Gracie, was not a fan. She didn't condone this. This was her baby, her youngest child. She was so stressed out about Crystal being so young, but she was mostly worried about what the town would think about her. And she wondered if Crystal and Tom were having sex together. 
Gracie made a huge deal about Crystal, quote, living in sin, end quote. But Crystal was adamant that living with Tom was the best decision for her so that she could graduate and land a good job. Tom ended up going over Gracie and Ray's house and telling them that he didn't want to live in sin. He wanted to marry Crystal. Well, this upset Gracie even more. Her daughter was so young. She didn't want Crystal out of the house, even though it was a bad environment. But Ray, he gladly took over the paperwork to make it happen. I can think of a few reasons why he would marry off a 15-year-old girl, and all of them are cold and selfish. Maybe he didn't want another mouth to feed, or maybe he made some sort of deal with Tom. I don't know. I just know I don't like him very much from all that I've gathered. His intentions didn't seem very good. But it's what Crystal wanted, too. She and Tom got married in Harrison, Maine. This is about 45 minutes away from Bethel, immediately outside the town of Bridgeton. Now, Bridgeton had a population of about 4,500 people, and this is where Crystal lived most of her life. It's a town with one traffic light, no joke, and only several local businesses and a huge shoe factory. The town is touristy in the summer because it's near Pleasant Mountain which has a ski resort. In the wintertime, you can see the mountain's trails that spell out the word love. It's very romantic. The town is also where Stephen King set his novel, The Mist. It can get very spooky in those woods, but it's unique and a beautiful area. Crystal got married on June 20th, 1979 in a tiny chapel. The only witnesses were Tom's brother and one of his friends. Just married and in love, Crystal and Tom decided together that they were gonna move out to California to make a new life for themselves. Gwen, of course, was pretty disappointed when she heard the news that her sister would be leaving. They had discussed going to Bridgeton Academy together, but Crystal was ready for something new. She had grown up in the same town, around the same people, and this was her first chance to be anonymous and live her life on her own terms. It sounds pretty exciting. So they packed up and they drove all the way across the country in one straight line to a tiny town called Brownsville in California with a population of only about a thousand people. I'd never even heard of this area. Tom's parents actually lived over there and he did not warn them he was coming. He thought if he knocked on the door hoping for work, they wouldn't say no. It kind of reminds me of asking for forgiveness instead of permission. But Tom's dad had plenty of connections, so he was glad to set Tom up with a job servicing trucks in Marysville. Now, that area was bigger and more populated with about 12,000 people. And there, Crystal studied hard to get her GED. She was so successful that the high school offered her a job as an assistant teacher at the age of just 17. But Crystal hated the bigger city. It just wasn't her vibe. She liked living in a more simple area with a simple life where she could deeply connect with the people around her and not have to worry about crime and her safety. The couple eventually moved back to Brownsville, California, close to Tom's parents, where Tom worked as a mechanic and Crystal worked part-time at a cafe. She didn't have her driver's license at the time, so she got a bit stir-crazy. Tom was starting to go to bars and drink all night and stay out really late. So Crystal eventually told him she was homesick and they decided they would move back to Bridgeton, Maine. So just after a year and a half of living in California, Crystal returned to her family and friends. You never know what you have until you leave sometimes. And she quickly landed a job at Bridgeton Sebago Shoe Shop, which is also known as Pleasant Mountain Moccasin. Crystal was so detail-oriented and she worked really hard. Her job was actually to stitch shoes together, especially loafers and boating shoes. She was a natural. She had strong hands and very precise movements. She and the other women in the shop, including her friend Penny, who worked right across from her, they would race to see who could complete the shoes the fastest. The average person could do about five bins of shoes a day, and Crystal, she did six. So from 6 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, Crystal sewed shoes. The work was exhausting, as you can probably imagine, and it was easier to sew shoes while standing up. So over time, sadly, Crystal started to develop carpal tunnel, but she loved being able to provide for herself, and she found a strong sense of community at this shop. When Crystal finally turned 18, she found out that she was pregnant, and she was so overjoyed. But she started to grow a little concerned about her living situation. Tom was working a lot, but he was doing a bunch of odd jobs. He was mainly a mechanic, 
but he dabbled in construction and carpentry work. And then every evening, he would go out to his favorite bar, Sulky's, and he would drink all night. He just loved to party a lot. When Crystal told him she was pregnant, he was so thrilled because he loved children and he was determined to clean up his act. But unfortunately, Tom struggled to stay sober and he just went back to his old ways. Alcoholism is no joke. And it actually breaks my heart that Tom couldn't get it together to be there for Crystal when she needed him the most. He continued going out every night and leaving his wife at home. Crystal gave birth to a beautiful baby girl named Sarah, the other person you're definitely going to have to know in this case, and Crystal was the best mom. She tried her best to break the cycle of her own childhood trauma and truly provide for her child. Now, she didn't have many options when it came to daycare, so she did have to rely on her mother, Gracie, to help out. In the mornings, Crystal brought Sarah over to Gracie's house, and then after work, she picked Sarah up and played with her all night. Crystal would make dinner, they would watch TV together, they would dance, and they would read. Some of Sarah's earliest memories are sitting on the couch in the evenings with Crystal while she threaded her needles for work the next day. Now, I love learning about these things, and I learned a little about the process, and I thought it was really cool. It's called waxing. Basically, you cut all the threads the same length and take a ball of soft wax and run it over the ragged edges of the thread so that it makes threading the needle easier. I didn't know. Now I know. Now, this was a routine that Crystal and Sarah did together every night for years. Unfortunately, Tom, he was rarely home, and his drinking horrified and frustrated Crystal. He was becoming violent and aggressive, and he would spend large amounts of money going out. One time, Crystal even asked him to please set aside some money for groceries, and when she got home from work, she saw that he spent all of their money on, you guessed it, Sulky's, his favorite bar. So she actually went down there and confronted him. They got in a fight and Crystal ended up punching him in the face, not saying it's right, but this woman was at her wit's end. They were having loud arguments every single night and Crystal's anger would often get the best of her. Eventually, Crystal gave up on waiting for Tom to get it together. She filed for divorce and Tom didn't even show up to court. For years, Crystal would talk about how much of a bad husband he was, but she did choose to keep his last name because I'm sure a part of Crystal still loved him. They had spent many years together, and he was still the charming, good-looking, motorcycle-obsessed Tom that she always knew, but he just had fundamental flaws. It is hard when you love someone, you love the person, but you don't love the addiction. For some time, Crystal made an effort to keep Tom in her daughter Sarah's life, at least so she could have a father figure around. And Tom did make an effort as well. He would take Sarah for ice cream, he would buy her presents, but he rarely paid his child support. And since he worked those odd jobs mostly for cash, he didn't report the money that he earned to the state. And then, even worse, he moved in with a woman named Teresa who also had substance issues of her own, and she was violent and jealous. She didn't like the fact that Tom had been married to Crystal and that they had a kid together. So Teresa ended up harassing Crystal for years. This was not something to take lightly. I'm talking about she sent her death threats over the phone. She would come up and fight her in bars. I mean, she got physical. It really wasn't a good situation. And Crystal was afraid that her daughter might now come in contact with Teresa if she was over at her dad's. So she had a heart to heart with Sarah. And she asked if she really wanted to keep seeing her father. And by that time, Crystal was dating a new guy, someone that Sarah thought of as a dad, a father figure. So Sarah said it didn't really matter whether she stayed in touch with her biological father or not. So the rest of her childhood, Sarah would just see Tom around town, but she didn't really truly connect with him until she was an adult. So let me tell you about Crystal's new boyfriend. His name was Dale Morton. They met at a bar, and I won't judge, because honestly, there weren't too many places to meet someone in such a small town. But Dale was calm. He was laid back at first. Crystal moved into his house, which they collectively referred to as the dump, because poor Dale didn't have much money coming in, and he had gotten a back injury because of a construction job, so he wasn't currently working either. The house was a mess. He spent most of his days gardening and fishing and waiting for a settlement check to come in. Eventually, that check did come in from his former employer, and he was able to buy a new house, and that was good. 
Living with Dale, Crystal was able to actually buy her first car. It was a cute black Ford Tempo, and it gave her the freedom to visit her family and really start to enjoy herself. I always ask questions in these videos because I want to get to know you. What was your first car? Mine was my grandma's black Thunderbird. Crystal and Sarah would go on long drives together, and Crystal would do what they would refer to as a car dance, which is basically jamming out to music and embarrassing the heck out of her daughter. She would also quiz Sarah to make sure she knew all the cool songs and bands. This makes me miss my own mom. Sometimes the two of them would go on road trips to Portland, Maine to collect sand dollars at the beach. Other times, Crystal drove all the way to Boston to visit her sister, Glenice, and see museums there. Crystal finally felt that she had the independence she always dreamed of, and that was awesome. It's so crazy what just having a vehicle, a means to get around, can do for someone. Sarah was thrilled to be living with her mom's new boyfriend, Dale, and having him as a father figure. He taught her about all types of trees, how to ice fish, and even though he didn't really like to be called dad, Dale tried to be there for Sarah, but he had his own issues. He was growing illegal drugs down in the basement, and he would turn them into pills and then sell them, and Crystal started getting really concerned that he was going to get caught. The grow lights in the basement made their electricity bill very high, so it was kind of obvious that he had an undercover operation going on, and Crystal was afraid that the government would find out and they would take Sarah away from her. And just like in the past with other men, they started to fight. Crystal and Dale began having these loud screaming matches and it was always in the kitchen. Why is that? But that wasn't the only place they got in fights. They even got into a fight at a bar. Crystal was upset that night and she began drinking. She ended up taking out her anger she had about Dale by going home with another man. And when Dale found out, he accused her of sleeping with somebody else. So he made her go to rehab for her alcohol issues, even though Crystal did not have a drinking problem. She knew she made a mistake and she regretted that, but she didn't do it because she drank too much. She did it because she was upset. Unfortunately, this event fundamentally changed her and Dale's relationship and he became increasingly violent towards her. And over time, all of the thrown plates and the punched walls, it became too much. Crystal moved herself and Sarah back into her mother's house. At this point, it would have been about 1992 at the time. Sarah was 10, Crystal was 28, and her mother's husband, Ray, remember him? He didn't like kids. He died in 1989, so he wasn't around anymore, and Gracie thrived as a widow. Now, she could do things on her terms, keep her house exactly the way that she wanted it. She painted all the walls orchid purple and arranged the towels and everything just the way she liked. Crystal moving in with her mom was a lot. I think anyone that has to move in with their parents at 28 is hard. I know I love my relatives, but sometimes personalities just clash. I moved into my mom's when I was 29 and just had my daughter. I'm actually glad she was there for me when no one else was. And with Gracie, even though she gave her daughter a place to stay and she loved her deep down, she was a controlling and critical parent. She would scrutinize everything down to Crystal's outfits. And she would get mad at her for the littlest things like adjusting the heat by just a couple degrees or forgetting to replace the water in the refrigerator water jug. She criticized Crystal for even getting into a relationship with Dale, but then she also criticized her for ruining the relationship with Dale because she now had to move into her house. It was its own form of abuse, and it was really hard for Crystal and Sarah to live in that environment. They were finally relieved when Crystal was able to save enough money and get a government check to buy a home of her own. The new home was in Bridgeton on Route 93, which was regularly used as a logging road. It was a single-family ranch-style home painted black and white. It was in a pretty isolated wooded area, though at 135 Sweden Road. And when the developers put in this house, they ripped out most of the trees. And then they just replanted two smaller ones along the front entrance. So without trees covering everything, Crystal and Sarah actually felt a little exposed. You can see what the trees look like on the road right past their driveway. With many of them removed, they thought, who knows if some random person could be looking at them from the street. But since this was kind of a remote area, they weren't too worried. However, being remote causes other fears. If anything happened to them, it would be hard for them to get help. 
It was a five minute walk to the nearest neighbor's home. And with all the death threats that Crystal was getting from Teresa over the phone and elsewhere, Crystal was cautious. She always made sure to lock and double bolt the door. But this house was an absolute dream for them. It was true independence. And together, Crystal and Sarah made a little life for themselves. They spent a lot of time outside going on long walks along the road and buying a birdhouse for their yard. Crystal had freckles from spending so much time outside. And now that she was older, her hair had turned into this beautiful dark red auburn color. She wore blue eyeliner every day, which made her blue eyes pop even more. And she was really into fashion. She loved wearing those big white cuffed shirts, floral dresses, sunglasses, and flashy necklaces. Crystal liked wearing nice jewelry and really pretty perfume and going out and getting a perm. This home was Crystal's oasis where she could really finally practice some self-care and be the best mom possible. Since Crystal was so young, people would actually mistake her and Sarah for sisters instead of mother and daughter. Sarah said they were like sisters too. They hung out all the time at the mall. They went to the movies together. They liked to go pick out a VHS tape, get some dinner at House of Pizza, which was only a five minute drive off Main Street where all the shops and restaurants are in Bridgeton. And then the two of them would watch a scary movie. Their favorites were The Shining and Children of the Corn, and every year they dressed up for Halloween. Sarah as a pirate and Crystal as a vampire. Crystal actually loved true crime. She had books on Ted Bundy and the Mansons, even though she didn't let Sarah read them because they were too graphic in her opinion. On Thursday nights, they watched Seinfeld together. On Saturday mornings, Crystal cooked pancakes and bacon while Sarah watched Garfield, and every night, Crystal sang to Sarah and tucked her into bed. She truly sounds like a super mom. And Sarah was quoted saying that she always knew that she was loved. And I want to thank Sarah so much for really capturing her life in her book, After the Eclipse, which I'm linking below in the description box because it's where I got a lot of this information. It is such a beautiful and heart-wrenching novel. Crystal was absolutely full of life and super down to earth. She was not religious, but she was spiritual, and she really enjoyed pulling cards from her deck of tarot cards. She appreciated the small things and the little moments she shared with her loved ones. She was the closest with her sisters Gwen and Glenice, and every Thanksgiving and Christmas and summer, she would spend with them. She also spent a lot of time with her mom, Gracie, and at that point, she couldn't drive, so Crystal would go over there and pick her up and take her shopping. Even though her mom never told Crystal how much she appreciated those trips— because that just wasn't the type of person she was. She did tell others that Crystal being around made her feel a lot less lonely. Crystal was just that kind of person. She was generous, loyal, and devoted to her family. The only thing that weighed on her was a struggle to find a loving, supportive partner. She had grown up with a ton of misogynistic jerks, and she was just unlucky. I mean, when you live in such a small town, it's really slim pickings. Even though Crystal was such a catch, it's sad. And this took an extreme toll on her mental health. She had anxiety and she had self-esteem issues. When Crystal turned 29, she started to go to a therapist so she could talk about her thoughts of self-harm. And it was that bad. I feel so bad for Crystal. She told her therapist she just felt unable to do anything by herself. And I think it is important to take yourself on dates. I wish Crystal would have been able to do that for herself. She was spontaneous, hardworking, energetic, mischievous, kind, the whole package. She just kept finding men that refused to treat her like a queen. And it affected her self-worth. The next guy she met was Tim. He was a younger guy in his early 20s. And it was a long distance relationship. They actually met through mutual friends. And Tim... He just wasn't ready to settle down. There's always something. He was still in school to become an electrician, and he didn't want to get married until he landed a steady job, which is reasonable. Also, he had some baggage. His ex-girlfriend cheated on him, so he had major trust issues, and he told Crystal he would never be able to tell her that he loved her. I mean, at least he's being honest, but at the same time, it can be seen as pretty cruel not giving Crystal a chance because of his past. But it was never meant to be. Crystal wanted a stable partner who she could marry and have another child with. She dreamed of being able to give Sarah a little brother. She was so happy when she met Tim, but they would have these intense fights because they just didn't see eye to eye in their relationship and they ended up breaking up. But it was kind of an on and off again relationship that took a little time to actually burn out. That year in 1992, Crystal was still working full time at the shoe shop 
When a new guy started working there, he was even younger than Tim. He was 19. He was tall, thin, and handsome. He had bright blue eyes, and she liked that he wore an earring. I get it. A little edgy. I can see the appeal. His name was Dennis, but he went by Denny, and he worked with the machines. But he was known for throwing tantrums every day at these machines, which eventually got him fired. When they met, Crystal was still dating Tim, and Dennis was actually married but they started hanging out just as friends, and Dennis would do little things for Crystal like fix her car or work on other things at her house. They flirted, but nothing actually happened until Dennis's wife cheated on him, and the two of them got a divorce. Crystal and Dennis got together after that, and Dennis adored Crystal. He came over every Wednesday and Saturday night, and he proposed to her on several occasions, but she was like, I can't take this seriously. If it's for real, I need to see a ring. But as amazing Dennis seemed to be, he also had a temper. Why? I was hoping that he would be different. And they too started having fights regularly. Now, Dennis did buy that ring, and he planned to propose to Crystal on her 30th birthday. But that night, instead of sliding a ring on her finger, they got into an explosive argument. It went so far that both of them were just screaming and throwing things. They slipped into a toxic routine. And this just kept happening in Crystal's life over and over again with every man. Dennis actually broke the siding of the house. He punched the walls in, and he even totaled his truck after they got in an argument. He was controlling. He would convince Crystal to do things like cut off her beautiful red hair and make it really short and more masculine. And that is a huge sign of an emotional control over someone and of jealousy controlling someone's hair like that. A lot of time abusers use this as a way to diminish their partner's self-worth. And poor Crystal, she had already been through so much of that time before meeting Dennis. Now, Sarah was 11 and everything she saw was pretty normal to her. She thought Denny was just being Denny. She didn't really consider him violent. He just threw tantrums, adult ones. But keep in mind, Sarah had seen her mom get in fights with Tom and Dale, and Tim, and now Dennis. So this is sadly what she thought relationships looked like, and so did I for so very long, and I'm so sorry for anyone that has experienced this. Crystal knew their relationship wasn't 100% healthy, but they still had feelings for one another. Dennis loved to talk about the future, and he promised to build Sarah a tree house, and the three of them would go on long walks and drives together, just enjoying each other's company. Now, Dennis did eventually propose to Crystal, and she said yes. But in therapy, Crystal talked about her relationship with Dennis and how it affected her mental health. At her sessions, she discussed how to set boundaries with Dennis. If they were to really get married, their fights could not be so explosive. It just wasn't fair to her or to Sarah. If he didn't get his act together, There were other fish in the sea, even though the sea is kind of small where she is. But being alone is sometimes better when you're in this toxic environment. Sarah said this about her mom, quote, in her romantic selections, she could have done better and she could have done worse, end quote. Crystal did everything in her power to make a great life for her daughter and to find the love that she herself deserved. On Tuesday, May 10th, 1994, 30-year-old Crystal and 12-year-old Sarah witnessed a solar eclipse together. They always bonded over big weather events like that, and together they watched the moon partially cover the sun, marveling at how cool it was just to be alive. They had no idea what was ahead of them. Just like the moon had covered the sun and brought darkness to the earth, a blanket of darkness was about to come over their lives. The next day, Crystal went to work and Sarah went to school. They came home, ate dinner, and they did their normal routine. Sarah doesn't remember a single thing about it because it was so normal. It was an average day, automatic, easy, and natural. And then Sarah went to sleep. But in the middle of the night, she woke up to the sound of her mother screaming. Now remember, Sarah was used to this. At first, she thought that it was just Crystal having an argument with Dennis. He usually came over on Wednesday nights, so it made sense. And the two of them were in a rough patch. But Crystal was screaming no at the top of her lungs. And she was doing it over and over again. It was terrifying. She didn't usually sound this scared. Sarah wasn't sure what she should do. So she called out, mom. And then she panicked 
because her bedroom door was still open just a crack. What if this person fighting with her mom wasn't Dennis? And what if they looked in and realized Sarah was in there? She got scared. She didn't know who was out there. So she crept slowly towards her bedroom door. She couldn't see the kitchen from her bedroom, but it was right down the hall, less than 15 feet away. Crystal just kept screaming over and over again and pleading for her life with this person she was fighting with. Sarah shut the door, and when it clicked, there was the stark sound of someone stomping toward her. She scrambled back towards her bed and listened to the footsteps. She was expecting her door to open and be confronted by this monster with nowhere to go. But instead, she heard the sound of one of their kitchen drawers opening up. Silverware was being shuffled around, and the metal utensils clanked against one another. Then, she heard something being pulled out. It was a sliding sound, metal on metal. And then Sarah heard a loud, wet thud over and over again, while her mother kept screaming. Later, she would recount it as a, quote, gigantic fish, a 500-pound deep water sturgeon wet and thrashing for air and life on the hollow kitchen floor, end quote. That is quite a description. She knew Crystal was being hurt by someone in the other room, and as a matter of fact, Sarah was sure that she was hearing someone killing her mother. But if she tried to come to her mother's rescue, she didn't know if she would be next. She didn't know who was out there. She didn't know what they had done to her mother. And Sarah didn't know if this person knew she was there. Time just stood still. After the thudding noise, Sarah heard what sounded like a man's grunt. And then the sound of a phone beeping off its hook. She didn't dare move. Minutes passed in silence. She wasn't sure if the attacker had left the house, but she knew that she had to make her way to her mother if she had any chance of still being alive. When she felt safe enough, Sarah crept into the living room. The kitchen light was switched off. Everything was illuminated just by a nightlight. Sarah looked at the clock in the kitchen and noticed it was exactly one o'clock in the morning. And then she turned towards the living room. There was her mom, wearing her favorite blue bathrobe, lying on the ground in a pool of blood. There was so much blood. And in a state of panic, Sarah didn't know if the figure on the ground really was her mother. Her mind was racing. Sarah actually pinched herself to make sure this was real. She went up to Crystal's body and she touched her calf. Her mom didn't move. And Sarah knew in her heart that this was so much blood. It was too much blood. And she knew she needed to call the police. Sarah noticed that her mother's hand was actually reaching for the phone. It was still in that position. She had tried to call for help and it accidentally knocked the phone off its hook. The receiver was laying on the floor right next to Crystal's body. Sarah quickly picked it up and she dialed 911 desperately, but the line was completely blank. There was just silence. There was no one on the other end and not even a dial tone. So Sarah panicked. She wanted to save her mom. She had to. She ran down the long hallway to Crystal's room where another phone was located. She quickly punched in the numbers 911 and held the receiver to her ear. She waited for it to ring, but there was nothing. She called again and again, and she didn't know why it wasn't working. Sarah then prepared herself to do what she knew she had to do. Without any time to even put on her shoes, she ran outside in her bathrobe, all alone in the darkness, in the middle of the night, to find help. It was May. It was still cold outside and steadily raining. Little Sarah ran barefoot into the darkness, heading for the nearest home. And I cannot imagine my daughter as she's the same age, 12. It's heartbreaking to think about Sarah in this situation. She was so brave. Sarah knew the owners, the demerits, in the house about a half a mile away. Half a mile is far enough to be walking, but in pitch darkness on this rural road, it was a lot more difficult. When she finally got there, Sarah banged on their front door yelling, help me, my mother's been stabbed. She punched the door again and again, but nobody answered. Then she ran down the street five more minutes to two other homes. She didn't know who lived there, 
but neither one of them answered anyway. At this point, part of Sarah was completely dissociated and the other part of her was fighting to inform the police about what she had just seen. And it seemed at that moment she was the only person alive because in her mind, everyone in the world must be dead. She wasn't getting an answer, but she didn't give up. She ran another 10 minutes down the road through the dark woods before she reached the Wilson's house. They didn't answer either. At this point, Sarah had run over a mile and there was only one more building before the intersection of Route 302. That's where the town of Bridgeton begins. And Sarah promised herself she would knock on every door in town until someone opened up. She'd even passed a small cemetery in the dark, but she could finally see the next building. It was a fancy Italian restaurant called the Venezia, where the owners lived out back in a connected portion. The couple was still awake after closing up for the night, and they heard the knocks on the door. They immediately answered and were struck by the image of a 12-year-old little girl soaking wet, out of breath, and covered in blood. The girl said that someone had stabbed her mother, and she was scared that they might be after her, so she needed to use their phone to call 911. Of course, the couple let her in and helped her call the police. Once Sarah was on the line, she calmly told the operator what she had seen. I have a portion of this 911 call, and I want to play it for you now. Wow. I cannot imagine being so young and being in this dire situation. The police were sent out immediately. And once they got on the scene, it was clear from her injuries that Crystal was already dead. And it wasn't an accident. Homicide detectives were called in and by 2 a.m., forensic investigators arrived at Crystal's house and found the most horrific crime scene. There was blood everywhere. It's not an exaggeration. It was in the kitchen, the living room, all over the furniture, on the floors and on the phone. Investigators took photographs and video footage of this crime scene. They're so brutal, I cannot show them here. But Crystal's entire face and head were covered in so much blood, you couldn't make out any of her features. There was also blood droplets, smears, and smudges all over her bare legs, and her robe was soaked in blood. And Crystal just lied there on the linoleum floor in her kitchen, and there were portions of the carpet with blood sprays all over them. It left behind evidence of each time the knife went in. The investigators cut squares out of the living room carpet in order to compare the normal fiber samples to the ones with blood on them. The crime scene technicians removed whole portions of the couch with blood on them. Investigators tried to find fingerprints, but they only found some on the glass door. One full palm print that looked like it belonged to Sarah by the size of it, and one print with the very tips of the fingers. There weren't any other fingerprints in the house, which had been spotless before this killer came in. Remember, Crystal liked to keep her things in order like her mother Gracie did. There were boot prints everywhere in the kitchen going in multiple directions. It looked like the perpetrator had tried to head towards Sarah's door, but never made it there. Maybe Crystal had distracted him so that he wouldn't get to her daughter. How sad is that? It also looked like the attacker tried to clean up some of the blood. And the investigators wondered why anyone would even try to clean up this much blood. But they had an idea why. It looked like the killer was racing back and forth through the kitchen, probably because they were cut. They were trying to clean up their blood. And they needed to find something to stop the bleeding. This left at least 20 of their boot prints on the floor in blood. They took samples of blood droplets on Crystal's legs and hip that looked different from her blood by the way that they dripped. It looked like they dripped from someone standing above her. I'm going to show you the actual pictures, but I'm going to change the color. See how they fall in a downward motion? Also, these right here, the way they're round, those come from above and they drip straight down. They thought this could be the killer's blood, so they made sure to take samples to analyze. It also narrowed down who they were looking for, someone with an injury, possibly to their hand. Blood, if you don't know, has the consistency of motor oil. It's very slippery. And as someone's getting that violent, stabbing someone, they're bound to slip and cut themselves with the blade. The more times they make that motion, the more chances they have 
for that knife to slip, and there were multiple wounds on Crystal. There were also droplets on the kitchen counter near the paper towel roll. The killer stopped the bleeding because on the way out, there were no droplets. It was ultimately determined that poor Crystal had been stabbed over 50 times in the face and head alone. Just think about what a small area that is and how many times someone had to raise and bring down a knife into her, disfiguring her. They could tell the instrument used was a sharp metal knife. She had been fatally stabbed in the chest. She also suffered defensive wounds, slices to her arms and her wrists, indicating that she tried to protect herself from her attacker. She had been stabbed so forcefully that the knife tip came off and it was lodged inside her head. Crystal's murder had clearly been painful, and it was clear the area targeted was her face and her head. It's as though the killer wanted to erase Crystal's beauty, and it's just so sad. Right away, they classified this as a crime of passion because of the overkill. It appeared as though the struggle began in the living room area, because that's where most of the blood was, and it went into a trail into the kitchen where Crystal's body was found. Now, this wasn't a robbery. Nothing was taken, and they didn't find any evidence of forced entry. There's something worse I have to tell you. I don't even want to talk about this. It's so horrible. But Crystal's autopsy revealed that she had been violently, and I'm sorry to say this, anally violated. It's horrible. There was bleeding and tearing and no evidence of lubrication. There was also presence of male semen only in this area and that was collected. Crystal had been on her period, so they suspected that her murderer was disgusted by this fact and decided to take away Crystal's control and her power and her vulnerability so completely that they did something so violating and painful just to get their way. It's possible that this had been happening while Sarah was asleep and that Crystal tried to stay quiet so that her daughter didn't have to know what was happening. Sarah didn't know this information for years, The news of Crystal's sexual violation was confidential evidence, but it confirmed to the police that they were looking for a male perpetrator. And it was so humiliating and painful for her entire family to know what Crystal was put through. They couldn't imagine who would do such a thing. I'm sharing these details with you because you need to understand how much of a monster Crystal's killer really was. This is complete overkill. And the question was, who would do this? Investigators looked at any clue that might reveal why someone would attack Crystal. They thought because there was no forced entry, Crystal might have let her killer inside. But it would have been odd if they were a stranger, especially the time of night. And while Crystal was so completely vulnerable just wearing a bathrobe and getting ready for bed, she either knew him or she felt sympathy for him. It was raining outside. So they wondered if she let a stranger inside that was asking for help or to use her phone, but would she? They thought a bright and street smart mom, she wouldn't let a stranger inside the house with her daughter there. So maybe she knew this guy. A detective named Dick Pickett was assigned as the leader of this case, and he immediately started crafting a list of possible suspects in his head. Remember, this is a small town. It was easy to get people to talk and to find out what they knew about Crystal's life. The first step was to talk to the only witness her young daughter, Sarah Perry, who was currently sitting in the hospital receiving the news from an officer, Kate Leonard, that her mother was dead. When Sarah got the news, she finally let herself cry. She was trying to be so strong, but there was no chance that she could have saved her mother. There was nothing she could have done. Crystal had died before Sarah even came out of that bedroom, and miraculously, Sarah had survived. At the hospital, Detective Pickett and police officer Pat Leanne interviewed Sarah to get as many details about this case as possible. They asked her, why did you have to run house to house? Why couldn't you just use the phone? And Sarah said that the phones weren't working. But when investigators got to the scene, they were able to place outgoing calls. Both of the phones worked fine. So they wondered if Sarah had been lying. The police figured that Sarah was just a kid who had made a genuine mistake. If the first phone had not been on its hook, it might have dialed and rang out already, requiring the receiver to be put back on the hook before it could be used again. And maybe in a panic, Sarah hadn't thought to pick it up, hang it up, and then pick it back up. 
I haven't used a landline in so long that I probably wouldn't have known that either. Then on the phone in Crystal's bedroom, maybe Sarah dialed the wrong number. Maybe she put in 991. Or maybe the landlines randomly cut out because of the storm. In Sarah's frantic rush to call the police, it made sense that she probably couldn't get the phones to work. It's just a scary reality that she had to run in the dark all alone to find help. The police asked Sarah to describe that day in detail. What did Crystal do the night before she died? Did she have any plans to see anyone? Had she been threatened? Sarah said she could not remember most of the day. No matter how hard she tried to pry open her brain, it was an average day. She didn't know what her mom had been up to. However, she did mention Teresa, the woman who had been threatening Crystal for years. But by this time, police had seen evidence of Crystal's violation and found it unlikely it would be Teresa or any woman who could have done this. Then Detective Pickett asked more details about the murder itself. He asked Sarah if she knew her mother's killer. Sarah said she didn't know. They asked her if the killer was Crystal's current fiance, Dennis. And again, Sarah said she didn't know. She thought maybe it could be, but she didn't think he was that dangerous. And then they wanted to know, how did Sarah know that Crystal had been stabbed with a knife if she was in her bedroom and couldn't see the attack? And Sarah responded that it was obvious it was a knife. She was like, what? Did my mom get stabbed with a spoon? She was definitely putting on the 12-year-old sass, but it made Pickett suspect that she was withholding information, so he put more pressure on her, even though she had just been told her mom was murdered. He kept asking questions about it. He especially wanted to know all about Dennis, because as you know, it's usually the husbands, the exes, the boyfriends, and the fiancés who end up being murderers, and there's always a motive. And in a small town Maine, it was common for men to commit violent acts against women, women they were with. But Sarah insisted she didn't know who killed her mom. She wouldn't cover up this crime, not for Dennis, not for anyone. She liked Dennis, but she loved her mom more than anything. If she knew who did this, surely she would tell them. But police didn't know what to believe. Sarah had been there the whole time, but she hadn't seen anything. They wondered, could she have blacked out or just not remembered this traumatic event? They thought there had to be something missing. Detective Pickett told Sarah that they would take another statement later, and then he continued with his other interviews. In the next three days, the police interviewed Sarah 19 times. She's only 12. That's insane. They asked her the same questions over and over again, expecting a new response. They wanted to know if Sarah knew who killed Crystal. Was it Dennis? Was it Dale? Was it Tom? Was it Tim? Sarah said again and again, I don't know. And when the autopsy results came back, confirming there was male DNA on the crime scene, Teresa was completely ruled out. But whoever had killed Crystal, whether it's her fiance, her exes, or a stranger, Detective Pickett was determined to find out who he was. The investigators ended up finding a shoe that was sold at a local store that matched the bloody footprints. It was an Oak Harbor brand leather lace-up shoe, so at least they knew what they could compare it to if they found a suspect. At 4 a.m. Thursday morning, so just a couple hours after Crystal's body had been found, four police officers showed up at Dennis's doorstep along with his parents. The moment Dennis opened the door, they asked him if he had gone anywhere or seen Crystal the night before. His words were, is she all right? They asked again, have you seen Crystal? And that's when Dennis panicked. He asked if she was dead, and then he actually passed out. He had to recover in a police car, and then they started the questioning again. Dennis told the police he'd gotten home from work a little past 8 o'clock as usual after helping fix one of his buddy's trucks. He called Crystal at 8.07 p.m., and remember, they usually hung out on Wednesdays and Saturdays every week. But since he was late, she was already upset the moment she picked up the phone. Dennis said he tried to make amends and promised to come over right now, but Crystal said, don't bother. Then they started to argue, and eventually Crystal said she was exhausted and promised she would just see him on Saturday. Police were able to confirm Dennis had worked at his friend's house on a vehicle, but no one could prove that he wasn't at Crystal's that night. The police asked him to take a polygraph test. They asked him a bunch of questions, including, 
did you kill Crystal Perry? Dennis said no. And he was telling the truth. But when they asked him if he felt responsible for her death, and he said no, the machine went crazy. Dennis was lying. He did feel responsible for her death, but why? Was it survivor's guilt? Was he just feeling bad he wasn't there that night to protect her? Or was it something more? He ended up feeling two polygraphs. He also wore the same size shoe as the footprints they found at the scene, but they didn't find any matching shoes in his possession. They didn't have any concrete evidence to hold him, but he did agree to give them a DNA sample. But when he did, he asked for a favor in return. He said to them something to the effect of, I know it's looking like everything's pointing in my direction. And if it comes to the point where I need to be arrested, please come to the back door of my workplace. He said that his bosses were always good to him and he didn't want to create a scene and disrupt the business. That does kind of make it seem like he's guilty, doesn't it? But maybe he just figured, you know what? I'm the prime suspect, so it's inevitable. I'm the fiance, gonna get arrested. Detective Pickett interviewed Crystal's best friend, Linda. They had known each other, like I said, since they were about eight years old. And they also interviewed her current boyfriend. Linda said, the last time she talked to Crystal was several weeks before that. Crystal had called her just sobbing over the phone, telling Linda she was scared. She said that her and Dennis had gotten into another screaming match, and then he grabbed her by the arm, and he punched the door, denting in the steel. And now she had to get it replaced. Crystal told Linda she was afraid of ending the relationship with Dennis, but she was trying to put her foot down. The arguments were getting so bad, according to Crystal, that she was scared of seriously getting hurt. Linda told police that Dennis was not the right man for Crystal, and that's quite an understatement. Nobody deserves to be around that kind of behavior. Crystal had called the next week on Friday, but Linda missed that call, and she told police she wondered if something had happened again, but now it was too late to know, and she felt so guilty. The police went over to Crystal's coworker Penny's house, the one who stood across from her at the shoe shop. The four officers informed her of what happened and asked her if she knew anyone that would want to hurt Crystal. And of course, Penny was absolutely devastated by the news. She gave them a few suggestions of men around town who had either harassed Crystal or made her feel uncomfortable. When the police left, Penny got an almost immediate knock on her door. And guess who it was? Dennis. They were friends, so she did let him in, and she gave him a hug. But Penny thought that it was very strange that he would show up so soon. It was like he was waiting for that exact moment after they left. And what was he trying to prove? She just found it to be a little odd. Over the next two days, police interviewed people all over Bridgeton, hoping the rumor mill would lead them to justice for Crystal's family. Someone reported that a man named Donnie Martin got drunk at a party and went around telling people that he killed Crystal Perry. When police brought him in for questioning, he conveniently forgot everything he said that night. And on Saturday, a woman named Miranda White contacted the police with a tip. She said she was in the area where Crystal lived the night she was murdered and that her dad had finally convinced her to call the police with this tip. Miranda said she got off work at Subway Restaurant around 1 a.m. She was driving home when she heard the sound of an ambulance. And it made her scared because her boyfriend was a huge troublemaker. He was always getting into something or getting hurt. And the ambulance was headed in the direction of his house. So she had a bad feeling. She was scared for him. So she followed that ambulance, which to her relief, passed her boyfriend's house on Route 302. And it continued to go to Route 93. So she turned around before she even got to Crystal's house. Then she headed back past her boyfriend's house and into town. But here's the tip she wanted to give them. She said that the moment she turned on Route 93, a car came barreling up behind her with their brights just flashing in her eyes. She thought that was really weird. It was just very out of the ordinary, especially since they were in such a rush. She turned on to Route 302 and then onto High Street. She was worried that that car was gonna tail her, but it turned off into a side road. Miranda passed her boyfriend's house again and drove the rest of the way home. She arrived just in time to hear a police scanner that they received a 911 call from the Italian restaurant. Miranda recounted the story to the police at the station it kind of seemed like a promising lead. They wanted to know what the vehicle looked like that was speeding behind her. 
could this be Crystal's murder escaping the scene? Police had more questions and they asked Miranda if she would do a polygraph, but she didn't really feel comfortable with that and since she wasn't a suspect, she was free to go. However, the police got one good thing from Miranda. Testimony about Donnie Martin, remember him, party, telling everyone he killed Crystal? She said he was harmless. He was completely wasted that night and just trying to get attention, which really doesn't excuse the fact that he's going around telling people he murdered someone. I don't know what's wrong with people. I've heard people do this in other cases and I have no idea why. Crystal's funeral was held four days after her murder. The sky was vividly blue. And after a short visitation, Crystal was cremated. She loved peach colored roses more than anything. And Sarah picked out peach colored flowers for the ceremony. But the funeral was tinged with the knowledge that anyone in this small community could be her killer. Wendell, Crystal's brother, believed that Crystal knew who killed her. She must know them in some way, and police thought so too. The crime just felt too personal to be random. The next few weeks, the family put up posters on telephone poles, encouraging people to come forward with tips. And when it rained, they replaced those posters again and again. It was only one of two unsolved murders in Bridgeton's history as a town, and people all over the area were desperate to know what happened to this beautiful, intelligent young woman. Detective Pickett and his team monitored all the locations that Crystal usually visited for suspicious activity, including the shoe shop and Gracie's house, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Eight days after the murder, Crystal's best friend Linda called in with a tip. She said that she had seen a newer model Ford pickup truck parked up the street from her. Linda lived close to Crystal and Sarah, so she often went on walks in that area, and Linda had never noticed this truck before. It even had New Hampshire plates. However, Detective Pickett thought this was pretty normal, since there were plenty of people who could have parked it there, and it wasn't exactly outside Crystal's house. But he wrote it down anyway, just in case, and put it in Crystal's file. Tips continued to come in, but the biggest lead was the DNA found at the crime scene. And it took between six months and a year for these DNA samples to be processed. Now, during this time, Detective Pickett had ruled out Crystal's ex-husband, Sarah's father, Tom, saying that he didn't think he was responsible, even though he did have a motive. He and Crystal were not on good terms. He was living with Teresa, who was also his alibi. And we know she's not a good person. She actually spent days ripping down the posters that Crystal's family had hung up. So they wondered if Teresa had convinced him to get revenge. But Tom, he didn't seem capable of this crime. First of all, he drank way too much every night to even have the coordination necessary to commit such a violent act. I guess alcohol was a saving grace because he was ruled out for now. But there was another man that used to be in Crystal's life, her ex, Dale. He was using a lot of substances in 1994 as well. And after Crystal passed away, he got in a horrible car accident that paralyzed the passenger of the car. Dale ended up going to prison for driving under the influence. And even though he was violent, his personality didn't seem to be consistent with this murder. And if he had done it, at least he was already in prison. But finally, the DNA results came back. Nine months after Crystal's murder, out of the police's seven suspects, Tom and Dale were exonerated. The DNA just did not match up. Crystal's ex, Tim, and other men that she met through friends were also not responsible. And Dennis? Not a match. He wasn't the murderer either. This was actually pretty surprising to detectives. And Detective Pickett was like, now what? Were the DNA results just wrong? Was he missing something? At this time, DNA processing wasn't like it is today. So it makes sense that they just didn't trust it. However, it was being used as incriminating evidence in really public cases like the O.J. Simpson trial, the reason I got started in true crime. So they needed to find this DNA match. And they got another DNA sample from Dennis. They wanted to test it again because they were back at square one. They wanted to really make sure they could rule Dennis out. Detective Pickett was still convinced Sarah wasn't telling the truth either. As the sole witness, there had to be something she was leaving out, something that she had blocked out in her memory. Sarah had actually gone to live with her aunt Tootsie in Texas, and it was already a very hard transition. She was terrified to be alone. And of course, she had trouble adjusting. But detectives went out there anyway. Detective Pickett, along with police chief Bob Bell and an officer named Dale Keegan, bought plane tickets for San Angelo, Texas 
Officer Keegan had been newly trained in FBI interviewing techniques, and he hoped, with the polygraph test and some time to think about Crystal's murder, Sarah might be willing to give them some answers. I don't know why they would assume this poor girl is lying about her own mother's murder. But on the first day, Sarah agreed to be hooked up to a lie detector, and Officer Keegan asked her all kinds of questions. Things like, do you know for sure that the person who killed your mother was? And then he would fill in the blank with different names of all the male suspects. Sarah said no every single time. And every single time, she was honest. But the officer still believed she had some sort of repressed memories. They just had to uncover them from the depths of her brain. Even Sarah's own Aunt Tootsie believed she could be hiding something. But Sarah insisted the only gaps in her memory were from the day leading up to the crime, not the crime itself. She vividly remembered that. I don't know about you, but I would be livid if people kept interviewing me over and over again and not taking me seriously. I just felt so bad for Sarah. After three days of interviews, Sarah even started to doubt her own memory. That's what happens. She told Officer Keegan she'd seen a blue car. And then she said, you know what? It could have been Dennis, but she hadn't seen him. Sarah had seen and heard Dennis in her house so many times and only mentioned the blue car once. So the police felt they had no new concrete information. On the last day, they got fingerprints from Sarah's hands. All of the finger and handprints on those glass doors in the home belonged to Sarah. So even the fingerprints had led to a dead end. When Sarah asked about the investigation, she was told that the DNA samples were still being processed, but the police lied. We know the DNA samples had already come back two weeks ago, but they were double checking to see if Dennis was innocent before they revealed to Sarah and the public what they knew. They don't like leaving anything undone in their line of work, and I think we know that all too well, and it's not always for good reasons. Who knows how long Dennis's DNA results were gonna take? It seems like it takes forever. Of course, it was still an open investigation, so the police could not reveal any details to the newspapers. People still speculated about what happened. One newspaper reported that a local man from the area, Lloyd Millett, who had been charged with murdering two other women, might be Crystal's killer. When they interviewed this man, he said he never ever visited Bridgeton before and he hadn't killed her. This ended up being true. There was nothing linking him to the crime, but news of Crystal's murder spread from county to county and people tried to keep her memory alive. By May of 1996, the family was exhausted with the length of this investigation. Crystal's sister Carol said, we're tired of waiting. And Crystal's mother told the Portland Press Herald that at the beginning of the investigation, she would call the police sometimes every other day. And they used to call her once in a while, but they don't even do that anymore. The family actually put out a $10,000 reward for any tips that could lead to Crystal's killer. They really hoped that people wouldn't forget Crystal. And Gracie was obsessed with figuring out who had taken her daughter from her. It was all she would talk about. The family deserved justice, and the Bridgeton PD knew it. For the two-year anniversary of her death, Chief Bell took a team of investigators to the shoe shop that Crystal worked at, and they interviewed the workers for six hours. They told the Bangor Daily News that this was an ongoing and active investigation. They were just waiting on a DNA sample, and we know this was Dennis's second one. It took over 10 months to process, but when the sample came back, it was negative again. The man was innocent. And I bet this was so frustrating for Detective Pickett. He had done hundreds of hours of interviews and he kept working on this case, but years went by and still he ended up with no substantial evidence. Then in the summer of 1999, when Sarah was going into her senior year of high school, Detective Pickett got a job in the Peru, Maine area and he left the Bridgeton PD. So another head detective was assigned to the case. His name was Lieutenant Walter Gribb. And sometimes you know it helps to get a fresh perspective on a case. Lieutenant Gribb got the ball rolling really fast. Sarah remembers that when Lieutenant Gribb got on the case, he and his team would draw so much blood for men for DNA testing, they were known in the town as the vampires, which I think is pretty cool. These detectives knew that someone in this town was responsible and they had been walking free for over five years. As part of Lieutenant Gribb's initial investigation, he contacted Sarah. He knew she had been subjected to dozens of interviews. So he promised that if she worked with him, this would be the very last time she was officially interviewed for the case. 
Of course, Sarah was a little hesitant at first, but eventually she agreed to help. She went to weekly sessions with a Harvard-educated psychiatrist and hypnotherapist named Dr. Daniel Brown. For several sessions, Dr. Brown tried to reveal her repressed memories. When he asked if Sarah remembered seeing anyone attacking her mother, she still answered no. The doctor finally confirmed Sarah had no significant repressed memories, and that was that. Sarah herself had been through a lot in the years after her mother passed away. The first few days, she stayed with Gwen, Glenice, and Wendell at Gracie's house. And then she moved in with her aunt Carol and her husband in Peru, Maine. Their home was an hour drive from Bridgeton in a dark, isolated part of the woods, and Sarah had PTSD and anxiety. She couldn't stand living at Carol's house. So when Sarah's old babysitter Peggy called Carol and offered to take her in, Sarah was so happy to move back to Bridgeton. But as much as it seemed like this was a nice gesture, there's actually a special place in hell for people like Peggy, and I'm going to tell you why. This poor girl, I swear, she's been through so much. First, Peggy told Carol that she was Crystal's very best friend in the world, which was a lie. She wasn't. And Carol didn't know any better. Peggy was taking advantage of all the money the state was sending her for Sarah. Whatever money didn't go to Sarah's needs, Peggy would keep for herself instead of putting into savings for Sarah. Peggy also had it in her head that in order to help Sarah, she needed to keep talking to her about what happened that night. Eventually, Peggy got so frustrated that Sarah wasn't responding to her therapy that she decided to send her back to Carol's house, which was actually a good thing. But after this, Sarah went on a vacation to her Aunt Tootsie's house in San Angelo, Texas. Tootsie was actually in the Army and had a husband and two young boys. Sarah stayed there for three weeks. That's when those detectives had flown out there, remember that? And Tootsie said she finally had a talk with Carol about how Sarah felt living there permanently with her. Sarah liked Texas. It was new, she was anonymous, and she'd made friends with an ex-door neighbor, so she said yes. But while Sarah excelled at school, staying with Tootsie, who was actually controlling and unpredictable, was pretty rough. They had a complicated relationship. Tootsie was strict about little things, including the length of time Sarah could take a shower and who she could hang out with. But Tootsie loved Sarah in her own way. And remember, Tootsie grew up in the same conditions that Crystal had. They were sisters and she was trying her best. She once made an entire scrapbook for Sarah for Christmas, full of pictures of her mother, and she addressed it from mom. Tootsie also convinced her husband that they should adopt Sarah, but then she got divorced. And one day she told Sarah, your Aunt Carol and I talked last night and we agreed it would be best if you went back to Maine. She gave Sarah two options, leave next week or leave at the end of her semester. Sarah wanted to stay till the end of the semester because she had things like band practice, and she wanted to say goodbye to all of her friends, but then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, Tootsie changed her mind, and she said Sarah would be leaving in three days, and that the adoption was just so that they could get health care. That's really sad. And I keep thinking, are people really this selfish, even after someone's mother has died? So Sarah did go back and live at Carol's house and finished high school in Peru, Maine. Sarah always loved writing and applied to Davidson College in North Carolina as an English major, but she maintained a good relationship with Carol, Gwen, and Glenice. Sarah graduated in 2004 and became an administrative assistant at the University of North Carolina, where she started to work on her memoir. Sarah even got a master's degree in nonfiction writing from Columbia University and held teaching jobs in New York. Now, Sarah is an assistant professor of nonfiction writing at the University of North Texas. Her first book that I mentioned, called After the Eclipse, was nominated as a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers pick, and a Poets & Writers Notable Nonfiction debut. Sarah has had a really successful career, and she attributes a lot of that success to her mother. Crystal had dreamed of giving Sarah the opportunity to be whoever she wanted, and Sarah went for it. In 2006, when Sarah was 24 and still working at the University of North Carolina, she got a phone call from Lieutenant Gribb. He actually had been promoted and was no longer working as the head detective on her mother's case, but he was still working closely with the detectives, and one in particular, the lead detective, Chris Harriman. He and Detective Harriman had put in hundreds of hours of work interviewing and investigating the case and preparing the evidence for a trial. Just in case, they were able to find a DNA match. And finally, 
after 12 years, they called to say they had solved it. There had been many rumors over the years that a serial killer had done it or a local handyman who was mad at Crystal for rejecting him, but they were ruled out. Here's how they finally figured out who Crystal's killer was. Back in 2003, nine years after Crystal's murder, a man named Michael Hutchinson had gone to jail for criminally threatening someone using a gun. Now, Mike and his friends were going around after a 19-year-old guy named Ian who had stolen some of their marijuana plants. They chased Ian all across town in a car, and Mike's friend held Ian at gunpoint using Mike's gun. Mike ended up receiving six months in prison and three years of probation. Now, the state of Maine requires that any person who's convicted of a crime go through a routine process of being entered into a database. One of the requirements is to provide a DNA sample. So they used one of those long Q-tips, you've probably seen them before, and they swabbed the inside of his cheek. They plugged his sample into the Maine State Police Crime Lab's database, and Michael just moved on with his life. Well, three years later in 2006, now 12 years after Crystal's murder, Michael Hutchinson was still on probation when he was charged with driving under the influence with his children in the car. He violated his probation and he didn't show up to court. So on the day of Mike's would-be wedding, while he was supposed to be getting married to Dennis's cousin, Christy, remember Dennis, Crystal's ex-fiance? Well, Mike was marrying his cousin, it's a small town. The police intercepted the wedding between the ceremony and the reception. They put Mike in prison again, and he was gonna be there for several years because they didn't trust him not to violate probation again. 21 days later, after they ran his DNA again in the system, it came up as a match to the blood and semen found at Crystal's house the night she was murdered. It was him. He was the monster. Detective Gribb asked Sarah if she had ever heard the name Michael Hutchinson. She hadn't, but there was no doubt about it. Michael's DNA was all over the crime scene. Unfortunately, it took this long because there had been a huge backlog at the main state crime lab. It had taken three years to even analyze Mike's DNA sample. And this is actually so common here in the US. Apparently Maine's backlog is a lot smaller than most states because it can take up to 10 years. They really need more funding and I wanna do something to help. I'm gonna figure out somehow, some way, maybe we can think of it together. Luckily in 2007, the Maine Department of Public Safety was given $200,000 in grants to help speed up the forensic examination of these DNA samples so that cold cases can be solved quicker. So Lieutenant Gribb explained that Mike was behind bars for another crime and would continue to be until his trial. They hadn't even confronted him about Crystal's murder yet. At the very least, Sarah was relieved to know that Crystal's murderer was locked away. But at the time, Lieutenant Gribb asked her if she could please keep things as quiet as possible. He still had to interview Michael, but he did let Sarah know that she could tell her family. But Sarah knew how fast rumors spread. She knew that if any of her aunts found out, the news would get to Gracie and Gracie would tell the whole county. But sadly, before Sarah could tell her grandmother who Crystal's killer was, Gracie passed away. She had dementia and not many people knew how quickly her health was actually declining. Gracie never got to learn who the killer of her daughter was which is just tragic. Lieutenant Gribb looked into Mike Hutchinson so he could prepare to make his case. Mike grew up in Bridgeton in a house where his father, Brad, beat his mother constantly. He was in the same graduating class as Dennis and had really poor grades in school. After his parents divorced, he ended up working for his father as a stonemason. At the age of 19, Mike lived with Brad on High Street, which is right near the junction between Route 93 and Route 302. Here's how close that is to Crystal's house, under two miles. Mike's mom lived a little further off Route 93, but every single time Mike drove from his dad's house to his mom's house, he turned onto Route 93 and passed Crystal's. He would have passed Crystal's house at least once a week. And Brad lived close enough to Crystal and Sarah that when they went on walks, they walked right past his house. There would be no doubt Mike had seen Crystal before, at least out and about in public, and he somehow targeted her for some reason. Mike regularly abused substances and sold drugs. He also beat his first wife in front of his children, and she had a restraining order against him. Both of these resulted in a long criminal history of DUIs, domestic charges, along with arrests between 2003 and 2006. This man was a criminal through and through, and now Lieutenant Gribb needed to confirm that he was also a liar. 
he visited Mike at the Cumberland County Jail and asked him if he knew Crystal Perry. He told him twice that he didn't. So Lieutenant Grubb was supposed to believe that Mike's DNA was at the crime scene, but he didn't even know Crystal? Nice try. Then, Lieutenant Grubb noticed a huge scar across the palm of one of Michael's hands. The police knew that Mike's blood was at the scene of the crime. Crystal fought back, so the perpetrator was bound to have a scar from where he was slashed by the knife. When Grubb asked Mike where he'd gotten that scar, he said it was from a car wreck he was in. But Grubb knew he was lying. He'd already lied about knowing Crystal. He would lie again and again, and this was going nowhere. The police obtained a search warrant. They took a second sample of his DNA, as well as a foot impression so they could confirm that Mike's shoe size matched the shoe prints that were found in Crystal's home. Then they did even more testing on the carpet fibers and the blood found on the kitchen sink and floor, and everything came back positive to Mike's DNA. There was no doubt about it, he was Crystal's killer. He was indicted on Thursday, April 6, 2006, and charged with the murder the next week. Finally, Crystal's family was able to get the answers they deserved. But stay with me here, because there is some really interesting evidence that Sarah and Lieutenant Gribb and Detective Harriman were able to find after the trial. I was shocked to see how much Detective Pickett let his own biases get the best of him. There were some avenues he could have definitely explored and didn't. This case did not need to take 12 years if Mike had been identified as a suspect right away. It was exactly a year until the trial, and during that year, Mike's lawyer motioned to suppress the DNA evidence at trial. How? When that was the main reason this man was going to be convicted. He argued that collecting Mike's DNA was an unreasonable search and seizure, but Mike had already been arrested. When you're in prison, you're not guaranteed all the same rights as someone outside of jail. And solving crimes is a lot more important than a criminal's personal privacy. Plus, they swabbed his cheek. They didn't take blood from him. So it was ruled that Mike's DNA evidence would be revealed to the jury no matter what. The trial was held in April of 2007 when Mike was 31 years old. And when Sarah walked into that courtroom and stared at him in the eyes, she said that he had the look of a man who had something to say. This man also got hepatitis in prison, so his skin was yellow with jaundice. Honestly, it serves him right. And at the trial, Sarah saw people she hadn't seen in years, including Dennis. After Crystal's death, Dennis had trained in special combat in the military and gotten a job working on White House security systems, all with the goal of getting revenge on Crystal's killer. From everything I know about him, he's no hero, but he had cared about Crystal and he really wanted her murder to be solved even though he had been a prime suspect at one time. Sarah was the first to testify. She said Crystal's death caused her survivor's guilt and PTSD to the point where she struggled to get close to people. Coming from such a large family, Sarah valued getting married and having children of her own one day, and Crystal wanted nothing more than to have her own children and grandchildren. But Crystal was never given the ability to have that little boy she dreamed of, or the family she always wanted. Crystal would never be a grandma because Mike Hutchinson ripped all of that away from her. The prosecution actually showed that videotaped walkthrough of Crystal's house. They took it when the sun came up at 7.15 a.m. on May 12th, just hours after the murder, and they showed everything from Crystal's body to the neat row of perfume bottles in her bedroom. Even after the attack, the greeting cards she kept were all standing upright on the kitchen table, which was just a bit eerie. Then they discussed the handprints on the glass door that belonged to Sarah and the boot prints of the perpetrator and the lack of fingerprints anywhere else. Investigators testified that Crystal was one of the cleanest people they ever had the chance to investigate. They called her cleanliness very frustrating, actually, because any marks that were left on surfaces almost immediately dissolved in the cleaning solution that was left behind by how much she cleaned. So they were unable to recover fingerprint evidence from the murderer. I've never thought about how someone's cleaning habits could affect the way investigators search a crime scene. It's good to know. But also, Mike was a mason. And when it comes to jobs that naturally wear away fingerprints, the top careers are dishwashers and masons. Who knew? I didn't. So it was possible that Mike didn't even have enough of a strong ridge in his fingers to create solid fingerprints to begin with. Finally, the prosecution brought in Crystal's blue 
bathrobe that she was wearing the night she was murdered, and the amount of blood on it was horrifying. It was quite a sight for the jury to see. On Monday, April 2nd, Michael Hutchins had testified on his own behalf. Why is it that these types usually insist on doing so? He said that he and Crystal had met at a local bar, and the night of her murder, he came by invited by Crystal, and they had consensual sex vaginally and anally. Then all of a sudden, after they were done, a guy wearing a black motorcycle jacket burst into her house, knocked Mike out, and then killed Crystal. And Mike had to fight for his life to escape, getting a deep cut on his hand in the process. So how did you plan to prove all this, you may ask? I mean, that was quite a story. And why would he wait so long to admit that? Why didn't he just say it from day one? Well, Mike told his attorney, Robert Andrews, he was ashamed. When Robert asked him, why were you so ashamed and didn't come forward? Mike pointed directly at Sarah and said, quote, I knew Sarah was there, so I did nothing, end quote. That statement actually gave me the chills because what does he mean he did nothing? I mean, he didn't kill Sarah, so was that the nothing he was referring to? Or did he regret killing Crystal with a kid in the house? Or did he regret not killing Sarah when he had the chance? During cross-examination, prosecutor Lisa Marchez absolutely wrecked Mike's version of events. She destroyed it. There was only one set of footprints on the floor, and they were his. Crystal was barefoot, and only one set of boots made all those frantic prints in the kitchen. There was no proof that a second person had been on that floor, so he couldn't have been knocked out. Lisa gave him one of those finger pointers and asked him to stand in front of the jury and map out the path that he'd taken throughout the house while he was fighting this intruder. And guess where he pointed to? Where all of those greeting cards were still standing straight up. He had no clue. And there were no boot prints near that spot either. He also pointed to the area in the kitchen where Mike said the intruder opened the drawer to get that knife. But there were no drawers on that side of the kitchen. He was just making things up and it was so clear. Mike Hutchinson was found guilty on Monday, April 9, 2007 for murder, extreme cruelty, and forced sexual penetration. He received life in prison without parole. Maine doesn't have a death penalty. Murder is punishable by anywhere between 25 years to life in prison without parole. So in fact, Michael was the first person in Maine in almost three years to get a life sentence. It's one of the more forgiving states. And he tried to appeal the sentence again because of his DNA sample, but again, he failed. When Sarah started researching for her book, she went through all the documents, the videotaped interviews, and the notes made by detectives. And she found out that Mike had been lurking in the shadows all along. For example, she found that car wreck report from June of 1994, the one where Mike said he got that scar in his hand. In the report, it said he owned a black Ford pickup truck with New Hampshire license plates. Wow. Recall hearing about a vehicle like that with a New Hampshire plate? Well, if you remembered Crystal's best friend, Linda's tip, you will be right. Sarah found Detective Pickett's report with a note from the tip that she called in. She said she was curious about a black Ford pickup truck with a New Hampshire license plate parked on Crystal Street. It was the same car. It was actually Mike's dad, Brad's car. And Mike used it all the time, right in the area where Crystal usually went on her walks. Why hadn't Detective Pickett looked into this? Because he didn't think it was important. Then Sarah found Detective Pickett's report of his interviews with that girl, Miranda. Remember, she was the one whose dad told her she's got to call in the tip about the car that was kind of chasing her down the road where Crystal lived. On the night of her murder, she was the witness who had driven by Crystal Perry's house on her way home from work. During her initial interview, I told you they asked her to take a lie detector test, but she said she didn't really feel comfortable. Well, actually, according to the notes in the file, Miranda ripped off the lie detector equipment. Didn't they find that a little suspicious? I guess I've never taken a polygraph test. I don't know. Maybe it makes some people very nervous. But the detectives didn't follow up with Miranda until the next year. And that was after the DNA results came in. Detective Pickett questioned her, and Miranda again said she'd been following the ambulance because she was concerned that her boyfriend was in trouble. And Detective Pickett wrote down a note for himself that said, quote, she's dating Michael Hutchinson, who lived up on Route 32 at the time. End quote. Wow. He literally wrote the killer's 
name. So Detective Pickett knew Michael lived in that area where Crystal was. And Miranda had been concerned about him that night. But they never once questioned the man. If they had, maybe they would have seen that big injury on his hand. Or at least the scar, if it had healed by the time they actually brought him in. So Mike was under their noses for 12 years. But because Detective Pickett looked at the case like a textbook overkill case, and he knew it was common for the perpetrator to be an ex-boyfriend or a fiancé, he was biased, and he let that get in the way. I doubt that he had bad intentions, but he could have followed so many different leads. For such a close-knit community, I'm surprised that Mike's DNA never got tested. Also, when Sarah was collecting information for her memoir, she had a conversation with her aunt Gwen. Gwen and her husband were convinced that they had met Mike before. She remembered coming over to Crystal's house with her husband for a surprise visit. Crystal didn't know they were coming, and little Sarah opened the door. And when they asked her, where's your mom? She said Crystal was in her bedroom. When Gwen knocked on Crystal's door, she came out with a young man, and it looked like they had just been intimate. This was around the same time Crystal had just started seeing Dennis. And Gwen remembered the guy looked about Dennis's age, young, like 19 or so. He introduced himself with a one-syllable name. Gwen and her husband could not remember what the name was, and now they think it could have been Mike. Either way, Michael Hutchinson committed the cruelest murder, and Crystal's family will never know how well they knew each other. Had they met at a party? Did they pass each other on their street? Did he target her? Did he come to her door that night and make up some story about his car breaking down and needing to get out of the rain? He could have even said he was a friend of her fiancé's. We won't know. But all of this was because he wanted to take something from Crystal. He wanted her body. He wanted pleasure on his terms. And he took that and more. We'll never know the truth. That's one gift that killers get to hang on to, knowing exactly what they did. Sarah will never feel safe again. She doesn't think Mike is insane. He's an, a sociopath. She thinks he's a man, like any other man, a product of our society. He's a man who grew up in a system of toxic masculinity and generational violence. He killed and violated Crystal because it made him feel powerful. And sometimes that's so much scarier than a one-off incident or even a random serial killer because these people slide by in society. They could be next to you on the bus or in a store. They could be someone's boyfriend, husband, or even their father. They're ordinary but evil. And Sarah wants to create awareness for the systems that create people like this so we can dismantle those systems. It's her mission to tell Crystal's story in a way that actively helps law enforcement become better at training new investigators and that will honor her mother's life. Sarah says, quote, I'm glad Michael Hutchinson is in jail, but I'll be glad when there are no more Michael Hutchinsons, end quote. My heart breaks for Crystal and for Sarah and all the women who are affected by male violence. Crystal deserved so many more years. She endured constant hardships and continued to still be positive and energetic and kind, a devoted mom, sister, and friend. She was constantly laughing with her coworkers, pouring energy into her work, and finding joy in the small things. Thunderstorms and making the bed and her favorite earrings and ice cream. She was such a passionate, loving mom, and she just danced through life. I'm really glad I could share her story with you today. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank Surfshark once again for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to check that link in my description box. I will see you in my next video. Bye.